Who controls the climate in your home? Is there a constant battle between you and your partner or your kids to turn the thermostat up or down? I live in an old apartment building in New York City and none of us are in control. It's the landlord. Climate control in our homes makes us comfortable and keeps us safe during times of extreme cold or extreme heat. Even though it's a luxury, it's something most of us have come to expect. But the world wasn't always like this for humans. Our story, the story of humans, began nearly three million years ago with the advent of our genus, Homo, in Africa. Our species, Homo sapiens, is the only species left within this genus. The rest are long extinct. Homo sapiens evolved much more recently, some 300,000 years ago. For most of our history on Earth, we didn't have climate control or even dwellings, and were therefore at the mercy of the Earth's ever-fluctuating climate. So how did our early human ancestors survive the tumultuous swings in climate for those millions of years before we had insulated homes and offices and commuted to and from them in climate-controlled cars, subways, and buses? In essence, the question is, how did humans deal with climate change in the past? The answer is, we adapted. In the beginning, that meant figuring out how to continually find new food or water sources, how to avoid being eaten by giant lions, how to successfully reproduce and then raise our young, all under fluctuating climates and changing environments. As time went on, it meant the development of language that allowed us to work in groups, to hunt or gather food, and to begin to share our stories with each other. When we left Africa, it meant adapting to cool climates by making warm clothes and building warm shelters. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution when we discovered fossil fuels, that's when we really got cozy. Since the Industrial Revolution, our need to control our environment to suit our comfort, we now realize, has come at great cost to the environment and ironically, now poses the greatest threat to our species that we've ever faced. And yet it's this ability to adapt, not our ability to control, which will be the key to our survival in the face of anthropogenic or human-induced climate change, which isn't as far off in the future as we think. In fact, in many ways, that future has arrived. Already we see rising temperatures, mega droughts, melting ice sheets, rising sea level, and in the recent news cycle, intensified and more frequent hurricanes and bigger, more destructive fires. Not just in the American West, but around the world from the equator to the poles. So what's at stake for humans in the face of climate change? From an evolutionary standpoint, it's the same for us as it is with every other species. Adapt or go extinct. East Africa is our ancestral home, our original neighborhood, if you will. It's where we evolved along with other large mammals over millions of years. It turns out the average duration of a large mammal species from our ancestral neighborhood, East Africa, is about 1.3 million years. 1.3 million years from origination to extinction. That's not long when you consider the Earth is billions of years old. And it's not long if you consider other species, like the horseshoe crab. Their distant relatives evolved more than 400 million years ago, and the ones you see on beaches today look essentially the same as they did during the Jurassic period 150 million years ago. The horseshoe crab sets the bar for species longevity. Let's now look at us, Homo sapiens. We are a mere 300,000 years old. When I look at the state of the planet today, I wonder, are we even going to be an average species and make it to our allotted 1.3 million years on this earth? Or will we go extinct before then and go down in history as a below average species compared to our large mammal peers, not to mention the horseshoe crab? Us, humans, underperformers and below average? Come on, which species went to the moon? Not the horseshoe crab. Who's been down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, seven miles deep in the ocean? A human. We've built skyscrapers nearly 10 times taller than the tallest trees on Earth. 
We've built pocket-sized computers that for some reason we still call phones that recognize their owner's face. We control the climate in our homes down to the degree. And maybe my favorite, which I discovered while in Japan, we created the Toto toilet seat, which opens when you enter the bathroom, closes when you leave, and even has a heated toilet seat. Talk about the ultimate in climate control. The point is, we've created a lot of amazing things. But as a scientist, I've come to realize that these technical feats are not the hallmark of humans. Our real accomplishment is our adaptability. Since the beginning, we've been forced to adapt to changing climate and environmental conditions. So what did that actually mean for early humans, and how do we know what our early ancestors were adapting to their ever-changing environment? The answer, as strange as it may sound, lies in our teeth. Because after all, you are what you eat. You see, in the natural world, organisms interact most with their environment when they're feeding. That means the shape of the tooth and even the chemistry can tell us about an organism's habitat, like what was on the menu. So as we evolved, our teeth were recording what we ate. Using chemical fingerprints locked in teeth, we've evaluated early human diets and compared what we ate with others. The chemical analyses have revealed that our diets were highly variable. And by highly variable, I'm not talking about tacos on Tuesday and sushi on Fridays. From the beginning, it appears that our ancestors were capable of sustaining themselves on whatever was around. This could have been seeds, fruits, nuts, leaves, or tubers. And eventually, we began eating calorically packed morsels like insects, shellfish, fish, and meat. Along the way, we also began using stone tools, an adaptive innovation that no doubt paid off. This adaptive generalist diet propelled the evolution of the genus Homo, which led to bigger brains and taller, thinner bodies. We can look to another hominin, Paranthropus, which comes from a different branch on our family tree as a counterexample. We know from the chemistry of Paranthropus teeth that their diet was extremely narrow, perhaps limited to grasses and their fleshy roots. Around a million years ago, Paranthropus went extinct, likely because of its failure to adapt to climate and environmental change. But Paranthropus lasted about 1.3 million years in Africa, fulfilling the average species duration that we have many miles to reach. For us to get there in the face of climate change, we need to return to the hallmark of our species. We must adapt as well as innovate, and we need to do it now. This means changing how we sustain our large energy appetites. It can't be fossil fuels anymore, and we need smaller appetites. We have to adapt in how we produce energy. This means more solar, wind, and hydro, and a lot less fossil fuel. If we do that, we might get to keep our heated toilet seats. But we need to adapt in other ways that don't seem possible yet. The coronavirus pandemic offers lessons in adaptation that we once thought impossible. We've had to adapt quickly to a myriad of challenges that we each face, not the least of which is staying healthy. We've adapted how we do our work, which is now mostly from home. We've adapted how we communicate, how we interact with our friends and extended family. We do this now mostly by Zoom or FaceTime. The pandemic is showing us that when presented with the challenge, humans are still capable of adapting in ways in which we never imagined. If someone would have told me last January that after March, I would not take a single flight for the rest of the year, I would have never believed them. Now it's hard imagining getting on a plane again. Anthropogenic climate change is the greatest challenge our species has faced. But you know what else is also anthropogenic? Our self-deception that we can't solve it. And for many of us, a sense of despair around the issue. We need to draw on our collective imagination, develop a united belief that we can solve this, and channel our efforts in a direction that ensures our survival as a species. By my count, we've got at least another million years on this planet, but we're gonna have to work for it. We're no longer unfettered in how we live our lives. There are rules that are non-negotiable. We can't slow sea level rise without turning down the thermostat on the Earth. It's no longer just about control. 
it's no longer just about what we want anymore. It's about adapting. And it's about discovering what we are really capable of as a species. <laughs>